I'm sure you can hear me because you could hear me with the, without this. My name is Catherine Carney Feldman. I'm a, the member of um, the Conservation Commission here in Ipswich, and it is our Conservation Commission speaker series that you're attending tonight. I'm very fortunate to have the Ipswich Conservation Agent, Alicia, right here, um, and she is going to be talking to you tonight about bats and um, white nose. Syndrome. I say that because I've got a couple calls saying, what is white noise and what has that got to do with bats? It's not white noise. It's white <laughs> nose system. Okay, Alicia Galen. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Again, my name is Alicia Galen, and I am, in addition to being your conservation agent here in town, I am a Speaking for Wildlife volunteer with the Uni University of New Hampshire's Cooperative Extension Program. Speaking for Wildlife is a program that brings wildlife presentations and nature walks to communities throughout New Hampshire. Um, but I've decided to bring this show south of the border, um, I live in New Hampshire, uh, to be able to share the important information about what's happening with our, our bat populations. So today I'm going to be talking about bats in Massachusetts and a new disease called white nose syndrome that's killing millions of bats. Um, this pro program that I'm going to be giving was actually created by two wildlife biologists. Uh, one works for New Hampshire Fish and Game and the other works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so even though I'm not a bat expert, the program I'm going to be giving you was created by bat experts. Uh, I adapted the program for New Hampshire to Massachusetts by talking with Tom French, who is the Assistant Director for the Natural Heritage Program at the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, or Mass Wildlife. And so he gave me the, the state-specific information that I needed. I'm going to talk for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then I'll be time for questions at the end. But if you have questions as I'm going through this, please feel free to stop me. So Catherine's going to be my clicker. All right, um, so why am I here to talk about bats? Why are you here to listen about bats? Because bats are really cool. Um, they they are seem a little mysterious because we don't see them very often, and we've maybe been told things about them that they're scary and they'll fly in your hair and such. But we, we want to be able to know the facts about bats and why we should care about them. So I'm going to explain um, some of the special ways that bats have adapted to life in the air. I'm going to talk about the nine different kinds of bats that we have here in Massachusetts. I'll tell you about white no nose syndrome, which has been devastating to our bat populations. And then I'll give you some information on things that you can do to help. So let's get started. So what's so interesting about bats? Bats are really important to our world's ecosystem. They actually, as far as mammals go, represent 20% of all mammals on the planet, which is pretty impressive. Um, bats in the tropics are very important pollinators of flowering plants, and in northern places like Massachusetts, they eat literally tons of insects. Bats are the only mammals that are true flyers. Um, their wings are strong and flexible, so they can fly really quickly and grab lots of bugs. And the if you look at the picture on the bottom right, if you held your hand out like that, that's what a bat wing is like. The thumb is at the top and they use that for grabbing and the rest of the fingers support the wing structure. They've got some little legs with, with another set of um, digits that are great for grabbing at branches and rocks and hanging upside down, but their legs are not very strong. Uh, so if they wanted to take off flying, they can't leap off the ground to fly. They have to crawl up a tree or some other vertical surface and then leap off and fall to begin their flying, which I thought was really interesting. Next one. So bats are the greatest predator of night flying insects in many places, including Massachusetts. They have very high energy needs. I think it must be like a hummingbird because they're, they're working so hard to flap their wings. They need a lot of food, so they eat lots of insects. They often will eat half of their body weight in bugs every night. Which, granted, they're, they have small bodies, but that's still a lot of bugs. Um, each bat species has a preference of the kind of bug they like to eat and how they get those bugs. Like, big bats might want to have catching bigger bugs. Some um, bats will catch the bugs on the wing while they're flying. Other bats will pick uh, insects off of a leaf or off of a spider's web. 
And so I'll be talking um, about each bat, a little bit about each bat in a few minutes. But bats are also important because they eat a lot of agricultural pests and forest pets. And what's the one thing we eat that we love that they eat? Mosquitoes. mosquitoes. Yes, love those mosquitoes being eaten, I should say. Okay, so bats have a special ability called echolocation that helps them find their way through the woods and also find their prey. Basically, they send out a high-pitched signal and then they listen really hard to hear that sound coming back at them and then that can tell them how close they are so even as they're flying and the bug they're trying to catch is flying, they can still hone in on it, which is pretty fascinating. They have an incredible sense of hearing, which makes them very hard to catch when bi wildlife biologists are trying to catch them. Because if you throw a net up, they can see the net, and they will try to avoid it. Um, the only time that biologists have an easier time getting them is if they put up what are called mist nets, which are very, very fine netting across one of the flyways, like a path or a stream. And if a bat is focused on a bug, it might not notice the net, and then it would fly into the net and can catch them that way. Okay, see the next one. So um, the sound that a bat makes uh, has a very distinctive pattern that can be picked up by a microphone called an anabat. A-N-A-B-A-T. I don't know if that has anything to do with bats or that's just what it's called. Um, some bat species apparently can be, can be identified by the sound they make alone. And so that wildlife biologists can, can tell by listening, oh, it's, it's this type of bat, and this is how many of them there are, so they don't have to even catch them to find out how many bats are out there. So Catherine, if you click forward one more time. Can you hear that sound? I can hear it. I don't know if anyone else can. I don't think the audience back home can't hear it, but it's, it's, a, it's a pulsing, clicking sound. If you, can, you can push it one more time, and it'll stop. Um, so that is the sound that echolocation makes when it's been slowed down to a speed that we can hear it. And they admit these sounds every 10, 50, 10 to 50 times every second. That's how fast those clicks. So we were hearing click, 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 click. They're doing 10 to 50 of those clicks every second. Um, and this picture here that's just come up, this is an Anabat microphone that's been set up on the side of Mount Washington. And some researchers are trying to gather some information. Okay, the next slide. You may have heard that bats are blind. You've heard the saying blind is a bat. Well, bats can actually see, and some of them can see as well as we can see. Next one. Lifespan. Bats live a long time relative to their body size. Little brown bats, which is the most common bat in North America and used to be the most common bat in New England, um, is the longest lived mammal of its size with a normal lifespan of 20 to 25 years. I know, it's surprising. Um, and like most long-lived animals, they don't have very many babies at a time. Usually they just have one pup per year, and the babies are called pups. Uh, and so if you're only having one or maybe two babies a year, you can imagine if the population goes down very quickly, it takes a really long time to recover. Tom French, that man I was telling you about from Mass Wildlife, he estimates that with little brown population bat, little brown bat populations where they are now, it will take 50 to 100 years to recover to the population densities they had before white nose syndrome hit. You know how long the young stay with the mother? I don't know, but I think it's maybe only a year, um, the, or at least they can they can usually they can fly. They have to be able to fly by the end of the first season. So that, there wasn't any information in the program about that. Sorry. Usually, when you have a long-lived, you know, lived species, they, they, they tend do to take a longer time rearing young to mature. Yeah, they usually they that that would be something. So it might be that um, I I do know that um, males don't hang out with the females for the most part. I think they all they all hibernate together. But during the warm season, the males are off by themselves, and the females are together in in maternity. Um, groups or by themselves. So it could be that if some of them are staying with their moms more than a year, that if they were females, they might stay with them more than a year and the males might go off. But So little brown bats actually are one of those species that only have one pup per year. So next. So uh, let's take a look at the life cycle of a bat. 
Um, bats hibernate in the winter in cool, damp caves or mines in the northeast, or they fly south and hibernate down there. Bats have adapted to hibernation probably because they eat mostly insects, and in the wintertime, insects are kind of hard to find. And remember, they need a lot of insects to keep, them, keep their energy levels up. So um, what they do is they low, they, they're true hibernators where they lower their body temperature, they slow their heart rate, they don't eat, they may wake up occasionally and, and move to another spot that feels more comfortable, they may get a drink of water, but they pretty much are sleeping you know, with their bodies shut down for the winter time. So they need, in the fall, they need to store up enough energy to get them through five months of hibernation. If you click Catherine. So um, in the spring, bats fly to their summer roosts, which are generally in trees or in buildings. Uh, a roost is any place that a bat hangs upside down. Some bats will stay in the same roost all summer, and others will move from place to place throughout the summer. Females become pregnant using sperm that they stored after mating in the fall, which seems kind of handy. Um, females become, uh, and then uh, the bats, you'll probably start to see them arriving in your neighborhoods around mid-April, so they'll be coming out of hibernation. Although this year, who knows, everything's a little bit different, but traditionally they would be coming out of hibernation within the next few weeks. Some species form maternity colonies and others roost by themselves with their babies. Um, the males always stay separate, I mentioned that. Um, pups are usually born in June and they grow very quickly on their mother's rich milk, like all mammals. They feed every night, navigating through openings, like um, paths through the woods, or stream corridors, or roadways. Um, and, let's see, uh, yep, and then so you can click the next one, and then we're in summer. Um, in summer, the, the, uh, the pups are born mid-June, they have the maternity colonies. I think I had all those points. I think I needed to click it one more time. All right, so in August to October, um, there is the fall swarming. Um, the bats are getting ready to go back into hibernation and they're all going to, all running around together, eating as much food as they can. There's mating going on. And if they, if they um, migrate, they're heading towards their, 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 their southern hibernation spot. And if they stay up here, then they're looking for just the right cave or mine shaft or the right kind of habitat that they want. Alicia, mm -hmm. um, could you tell me how old do they have to be when they can mate the first time? You might I have to repeat that. Um, the question was how old do the pups, I mean, to the, do the um, females have to be before they can mate the first time? That I don't know. Sorry. I have a question too. Yep. Do, do the same species, like brown bat, they can either hibernate or migrate, or they're different species, some migrate and some. So the question is do they hibernate or migrate, or can they do both? My understanding is that they're either hibernators up here or they migrate down south and hibernate there. So it's one or the, one or the other. Though where they hibernate can be different, and I'll talk about that when I get to the big brown bats. All right, so the next slide, and then again. So then it takes us back to October. Okay, so uh, in summer, bats that use trees for roosting will use different parts of the tree. Some like to be in the leaves, some like to be underneath the bark, some like really dead trees, some like alive trees, um, some will use old woodpecker holes um, or crevices in the trees. The endangered small-footed bat actually likes crevices in rocky hillsides and cliffs and will even use man-made structures, like this is a dam in the bottom right-hand corner. Those are the rocks uh, um, stabilizing a dam, and some bats actually even like to use that. Next. So little brown bats and big brown bats are what we often call house bats because in the summertime they like to be inside buildings. Uh, they like them because they're hot, and if the babies are nice and warm, they don't have to use their precious energy staying warm, and all of their mother's milk can go towards growing really fast. Um, and bat houses, uh, shown on the left, are a substitute for um, bats coming into a structure that you own. But they should be on the south or southeast side of the house, at least 12 feet up in the air, and preferably painted dark to make them warm up quickly. 
but I've also seen uh, information that bat houses can be put on poles. And I also found that one species that we're going to talk about in a little bit actually likes its hidey places about three feet off the ground. So if you have that kind of bat, then probably you would, the 12 feet would be too high. And I do have some information about bat houses there, but there's some really good information online about that as well. Right. Okay, so bats in your house. Um, the two species of bats I mentioned, little brown bats and big brown bats, often use houses as roosts. Um, they like it to be hot and dark and quiet. They don't want to be in your living room. So if they get in your living room, they want to get out as badly as you want them out. Usually, if you open the windows and close the doors and leave the room so you don't confuse them, they will find their way out quite quickly. Um, they, bats can carry rabies, which is a concern for a lot of people. So that if for some reason you had to handle a bat, you should use leather gloves. Um, if you think you've been bit by a bat, it's always best to immediately talk to your doctor. But as rabies is transmitted by saliva, just a bat flying around in your living room isn't going to give you rabies. You would have to have direct contact with the saliva from, from the bat. So if you have bats in your house and you don't want them there, what do you do? There are exclusion devices like what's shown here. It's sort of a one-way net that the bats can get out, but they can't figure out how to get back in. The problem is you don't want to put these exclusion um, devices up after mid-May or bef between mid-May and August because a female could go in there, have her babies. If you exclude her, her babies will starve to death, which is sad enough, and then you have dead bats in your attic, and that's not a good thing either. So um, you, can, you can, I guess, obtain these bat exclusion devices yourself, or you can hire a, a licensed professional to do that. Um, but you're encouraged to um, either put them up before mid-May or after August um, and don't ask anybody and don't do it yourself during those months when they would have babies. Um, bat houses, as we said, are, 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 are a nice thing to have and if you have bats in your attic and you're going to try to get them out, it's good to already have bat houses up and then they have a place to go to. Um, also, because of the catastrophic mortality of bats in Massachusetts, Mass Wildlife is asking people to report summer bat colonies of 10 or more so they can have an idea, uh, help them find out how many bats are out there and where, where they're hanging out. Next. Um, to get ready for winter, as we said, um, bats will either fly to caves or mines or migrate south to hibernate in warmer climates. And some species will fly as far as 800 miles in their migration, which is a pretty long way for a small little bat. Most Massachusetts bats, I am told, leave the state to hibernate because we do not have enough hibernacula, which is a word that means a place where they hibernate. And I, saying hibernacula, <laughs> I'll probably stumble over that several times, but. Um, so we don't have enough. And so what does a hi hibernacula need to be? It needs to have a steady 40 to 50 degree temperature and extremely high humidity, like um, 80 to 80% 80 humidity, but uh, up to 100% humidity is what they really like, which is why caves and mines are so popular. Um, in Massachusetts, I've been told that all of the hibernacula that we still have are mines and they're being protected for the most part. Migration is a hazardous thing, and if you click one more time, another picture will pop up. Those bats that migrate are having um, some problems with wind turbines, and I'm a huge fan of wind power, but apparently when wind, when wind um, mills are put on ridges that are in the migration pathway of bats, it can actually lead to mortality. So we don't know a lot about the migration routes of bats. Nobody's done a lot of studies on that until recently. So that's one of the things that people are concerned about when they're citing um, these great big uh, wind towers. Okay, next. So um, all but one of the Massachusetts bats are in decline, which is very sad. The one that's not in decline is the big brown bat. And that's likely because even though it's considered a cave bat, it will sometimes, uh, it seems less fussy about the humidity and temperature consistency, and they will sometimes hibernate through the winter in buildings. 
So because they have other places they can go, they, they seem to be faring a little better, but they are still susceptible to the white nose syndrome that's devastating um, the other bat species. So the ones that are, in, are outlined in white, the hoary bat, silver-haired bat, and eastern red bat are in decline because of habitat loss. Those are the migrators, and so they are also at risk because of wind turbines. Uh, the ones in red are all of the bats that are susceptible to the white nose syndrome, which is the little brown bat, the tricolored bat, the small-footed bat, northern long-eared bat, and the big brown bat. The Indiana bat has not been seen in Massachusetts since 1939, but um, it is susceptible to white nose syndrome where it's still found. They may still be in the state, nobody's just seen them. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these nine different bats um, that breed in Massachusetts. Next. So this is the red bat, so-called because of its red fur. Uh, and this is one of the, the three species that I mentioned um, that migrate south for the winter. They like to roost in the foliage of evergreen trees in the summer, and they are solitary. They, they are, hang out by themselves. And you, you can see them hunting in fields at forest edges, and you might even see them around streetlights, hunting bugs that are around streetlights. They are unusual in that they have two to three babies per year which is more than most species will have the single pup. In fall, they migrate to the southern, U, uh, southeastern U.S. where they hibernate under leaf litter on the forest floor, which I thought was kind of interesting. They have a wingspan of 11 to 13 inches, and they can be identified by their bright red fur. And when we're done with this talk, I, I made um, a little average wingspan kind of poster thing that just to, to give you an idea of what some of these average wingspans look like. Okay, next. The next is the hoary bat. They roost in trees all year round, um, up here in the summer and then down in the south in the winter. They like forests with dense foliage up top and then very sparse foliage down uh, closer to the forest floor so that they can navigate through the trees and hunt for bugs. They have two to three babies, which is another unusual bat, and are relatively large at 13 to 16 inch wingspan and they are considered quite rare and are seldom seen. They're cute little guys. Next. Next is the silver-haired bat. Um, that's the th third and last of the bat species of Massachusetts that migrate. They are dark in color and apparently can be recognized by their very slow flight. Uh, they roost in the summer under the bark of dead and dying trees or old woodpecker holes or crevices in trees. And these are the ones that I said like to be close to the ground. So three feet from the ground is about where they roost at. Um, they, in the winter, they head south where they hibernate in trees and rock crevices. Next. Hmm? Um, none of these bats are common anymore. Um, they, they, these are one, they're all in, they're, these ones are definitely in decline because of habitat loss. So next is the northern long-eared bat. Um, this bat is endangered in Massachusetts and was listed as a federally threatened species as of April, well, the, it came out in the Federal Register on April 1st, and it's effective as of May 1st of this year. And I don't know the details of there's, um, I'll talk about it in, in a little bit later, but there's a proposal for, uh, I think it was restrictions because it's a, a, a federally threatened species, there's restrictions on what some landowners can do in terms of their trees if they have bats around there. Um, I guess it's controversial. It's, I guess it's always controversial when somebody's telling you what you can and can't do on your land. But um, So uh, these are... Um, they, these are the first of the next six bats I'm going to talk about that are called cave bats because they tend to hibernate in caves uh, or mines. And um, all of these cave bats, except the big brown bat, are endangered in Massachusetts. Um, cave, cave bats might travel very far to find the perfect hibernacula. There was uh, a bat that was, some bats that were tagged in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and they were found hibernating in mines as far away as Albany, New York. 
So from there, even though they're not, they are not migrators, they flew pretty far to find the right spot to spend the winter in. Um, in the, they roost in trees in the summer and they hibernate in caves and mines in the winter. Um, they prefer to roost under the bark, so they like large dead trees. So this is another species that likes to be under the bark of large dead trees, so that's another reason to leave your standing dead trees standing if they're not threatening anything. All right. This is the tricolored bat, and they are also endangered in Massachusetts. They're relatively small, 8 to 10 inch wingspan. In the summer, they roost in trees. Um, the females have twins, and they live apart from other bats, so they're not going to be in one of those maternity colonies. During hibernation, they hang singly from ceilings and are often frosted, like the picture on the left, that's condensation. They like to be in the most humid of humid caves, as close to 100% as they can get. So um, the, the water vapors in the air condense on their fur, and that's what he's covered with there on the left. Um, their name comes from their colorful look. Um, I, I guess their fur and their wings are different colors, and there must be a third color on them. Maybe their belly. I'm not sure what the third color is, but that's why they got their name. Next. This is the eastern small-footed bat. It's endangered in both Massachusetts and New Hampshire. In the summer, they roost in crevices in rocky slopes and cliffs and even the rocky slopes of dams. Um, the picture on the left was actually taken by a New Hampshire um, state biologist who was looking for snakes on a rocky hillside, and he was moving rocks aside, and he found some bats. And that's one of the bats that he found. So um, they hibernate in caves, but they can also use cracks in rocks. Um, and they might even use something that would be such a small cave that humans couldn't even fit into them. So we don't even know that they're there. There's only one mine in New Hampshire that is still known to have hibernating uh, eastern small-footed bats, and it used to be one of the popul populous um, bats in the state. And um, they're very rare in Massachusetts as well, since they're endangered. Next. This is the little brown bat. They are endangered in Massachusetts. They live in houses and barns in the summer, preferring buildings close to open water so they can forage for aquatic insects, like mosquitoes. <laughs> um, they have one baby each year, and they like to hold it between their wings during the day, which I think is just adorable. They like to gather in very large colonies uh, with hundreds, if not thousands, of other individuals. In the winter, they all go to caves and mines, and they are the most susceptible species to white-nose syndrome, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Yes. I think they a sweet little face. All right, next is the big brown bat. That's one of the other species, along with the little brown bat, um, that you might find in a house, but apparently big brown bats are even more common in houses than little brown bats because they will roost in buildings both in summer and winter, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so in the summer, they are the most common, common attic bat, and they also use barns and other buildings. And at night, after feeding on insects, they may take a break and hang out in your garage or hang from your porch. You just take a break before they head out and get more insects. They often have two babies, which is, again, unlike other, bat, other cave bats. Next, this is the Indiana bat. Um, it's been listed as federally endangered since 1967 because of episodes of people disturbing their hibernation spots, their hiber hibernacula, which resulted in the death of large numbers of bats. In Massachusetts, this bat has been listed as endangered um, as a result of the pesticide DDT. Um, this species was last seen at a mine in Chester, Massachusetts in 1939. They are quite small. They weigh only one quarter of an ounce, or the weight of three pennies. So they're very light. Um, they, but they have a wingspan of 9 to 11 inches. Their fur is dark brown, and they hibernate in caves or occasionally abandon mines. And during the summer, they roost under the peeling bark of dead and dying trees. And they like to eat a whole lot of different kinds of insects that are found in streams and rivers and lakes.
as well as upland areas. It's like it's got a transmitter. Yep. So now, white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome is a new disease, relatively new disease in bats that's causing mass mortalities all over the eastern half of the United States. Many hibernacula populations of bats has dropped over 50%. And in hibernacula where white nose syndrome has been there more than two years, mortality rates are between 95 and 100%. In the Northeast, it's estimated that 70% of our bats are now dead. Uh, and one study predicted that little brown bats, the most common bat only three years ago, uh, a few years ago, will be gone from the Northeast in 15 years. It may be that their populations, as we were talking about earlier, may decline so far that there's not a viable enough um, breeding pool to, to keep the, the species going. Um, they, occ they occur all over the continent. And so even though we only have white nose syndrome at this point uh, in the eastern half of the US, they're in danger all over the country because they are so vulnerable to this disease. Next. This is a map that I downloaded yesterday because they keep updating the map very frequently that shows all of the places that white nose syndrome has been confirmed. Uh, in the middle of New York, there's a black area with a red circle around it. That's where the first white nose syndrome was detected in February of 2006 in Schoharie County, New York. And then you can see by the colors how it spread out from there. And now it's in every state east of my native Kansas, except for Louisiana and Florida. What's the organism, do you know? The organism? The yep, I will, I will be talking about that in just a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. That's OK. No, 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 that's fine. No, you're always welcome to ask questions. Um, so I want to make sure that I get all my facts here. Um, so it spread very quickly. Uh, and I'll talk about how it spread and why they think it spread so quickly in a minute as well. But I just wanted to give you some, some really sad facts. So our largest hibernation site in Massachusetts is that mine I mentioned in Chester, Mass. There were about eight to 10,000 bats there in the early winter of 2007 to 2008. And by the end of the winter of 2008, 2009, every bat had been killed by white nose syndrome. Um, in New Hampshire, they had completed hab um, hibernacula studies in 2011. And four of the largest mines, which used to house over 3,200 bats, were found to only have 16 bats. And one cave was completely empty. So it's, it's very, very, very serious. Next. This is um, a map that was on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's related to that new listing of the um, northern long-eared bat as being a federally threatened species. The area outlined in dark green is their known range, and the areas in orange are the areas where there is concern of imminent spread of white nose syndrome. And then the red, dark red areas are counties with known infected hibernacula. So you can see, and it goes up and you can see it even goes up into Canada. Very, very scary. So um, there is actually tomorrow at noon, there is a teleconference. It's the last of three teleconferences that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is having about this proposed 4D rule, which again has to do with something to do with um, how to protect their habitat and keep them from being disturbed. And if anybody's interested in that, just see me after, um, after the presentation and I can give you the phone number and the passcode if you, wanted to, if you wanted to sit in on that and listen. Next. So the symptoms. White nose syndrome affects bats primarily in the winter when they're hibernating. The first sign is a fungus on their nose or their ears or their wings. Um, you, can, you can see it on the bat on the left. Um, it is called by a fungus that was new to science uh, when it was discovered called Geomyces destructans. And the destructans is clearly a statement about how devastating it is. 
the fungus dies back in the summertime, so bats will generally groom it off of their fur before they start flying in the spring. Uh, in the summertime, their skin will look a little scaly, and then by late summer, you can't really see that it's there anymore, but they're still probably carrying spores in their fur. Um, so affected bats show abnormal behaviors. Some will move to colder places in the hibernacula, which is counterintuitive, because remember, they want to be warm, which is one of the reasons why they all cluster together, so they don't use up their stored energy. Others will fly outside in the middle of winter, either looking for food, or they're, we're not quite sure why. Um, but once they're outside, they're using up almost all of their, their, their fat reserves, and you will find them dead on the ground outside of the hibernacula or outside of buildings. And the only, trying to find something positive about it, they, they provide food for other animals such as foxes and ravens. Next. So, what causes them to die? This is a photograph, very sad, of dead bats on the floor of a cave in Vermont. Um, the bats are basically starving to death. And it's not 100% clear why, but we think it's because they, the, the fungus is irritating. It'd be like if you imagine if you had a rash and you're trying to sleep and you can't sleep, you're itching and it's getting you up and you're moving around. Well, they're supposed to be hibernating and saving all of their energy. And instead, they're moving around and they're uncomfortable and they're flying outside and trying to get some relief and they um, either starve to death or um, they die of dehydration because the fungus also affects their wings and they use their wings as a way of, um, of uh, dealing with water, taking in water or losing water. So because they have the fungus on their wings, they lose more water and can become, become dehydrated. There is no treatment yet for the fungus, and you can imagine it would be very hard to treat thousands of flying animals, and you can't put a mist up because they could see the mist and they wouldn't fly through it. So they've tried um, a lot of things, and so far nothing has been successful. Next. So how do bats get white nose syndrome? They can get it by touching each other when they're in their hibernacula and they're close together and they're rubbing on each other, up against each other to stay warm. The fungus can get from one bat to another. They can also take it um, if they are flying to, um, from their summer roosting area to a hibernacula. They can carry it with them then because, like I said, they think the spores are still in their fur even if they don't, you don't see the, the fungus on them. Um, and, and then next is, this is showing an example of, of a, um, a bat, some bats that were tagged at a, at a cave, the cave where the dead bats were seen in Vermont. From that same cave, they tagged a bunch of bats and saw where they went to, and that was how far they traveled um, for their summer uh, range. And some of them went to New York really close to where White Nose was first discovered. So we're trying to, um, we don't know a whole lot about where the bats go, and we're trying to map this. Um, but you can, you, can, you can see that it's, it, it, they could be spreading it just by themselves moving around. But it's more than that. So if you go to the next slide, uh, another way that it's very common for it to be spread is by cave enthusiasts, or spelunkers. Um, People who love to go from cave to cave, apparently um, cavers were really proud of how dirty their suits were. They wanted their, their cave equipment to be able to stand up by itself in the room. Um, and so they were carrying, um, they could be carrying the fungus from cave to cave. And I have actually, um, when I got my training for this class, um, I was told that they think that that's how the fungus got to this country. It's a, a fungus that's native to Europe and the bats in Europe are not harmed by this fungus, but we think that some European spelunkers came to America and must have brought it on their, on their equipment and then got it into the caves. And that also explained why it is spread further than bats will travel. So it sort of was leapfrogging places that it wouldn't be like only a bat could take it from here to here. So um, there are now decontamination protocols that have been developed, and they're on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's website. So um, we're encouraging everybody, 
if you have to go into a cave for some reason, um, make sure that you decontaminate all of your equipment before you move to another cave. Do when it was introduced? We don't know when it came here. We know when it was found was 2006. So, not that long ago. So, what do we know? Well, the good news is that many state agencies, the federal government, uh, universities, conservation organizations are all working together to try to find out why is this happening, what can we do, and, uh, we, and doing studies. So we, studies have already been done to determine what the fungus is, which we said, I said was the Geomyces destructans, and its genome has also been mapped to try to help us understand what, what is different between the bats in Europe and the bats here that it's, it's killing all our bats and it doesn't hurt them at all in Europe. We have also found out what it does to bats. It grows on their skin, especially on the wings, and it destroys the tissue. We've found out how it's transmitted. It's transmitted by bats um, from cave, you know, when they're in their caves, in the mines, and human gear can transmit the fungus as well. And we found out um, how the bats die from it. They appear to die from a disruption of their metabolism. So um, there's some notes in here. White nose fungus has, um, has been identified as coming from caves in Europe that are about 40 degrees in temperature and 80% humidity, which is the same as our caves are here. Um, and it's not. As far as they know, the strain of fungus here is not any genetically different than the strain of the fungus in Europe. It just seems to be our bats don't have a natural resistance to it, but the bats in Europe, because they evolved with the fungus, seem to have a resistance. Next. So there are many kinds of research projects going on to save the bats, including um, finding treatments, finding prevention, um, for how to prevent transmission, learning about their immune response of our, of our North American bats, and genetic work on the fungus and the bats. And we talked about how treatment is really, really difficult. You've got um, lots of bats, and they're flying around, and, and how, do you, how do you treat for them? Also, if you're treating for a, fun a fungus, you only want to kill the bad fungus. You don't want to kill good fungi, fungi that are in, uh, in the cave. So, like I said, um, they've been trying a lot of things, the scientists, but they haven't found anything that's worked yet. But they're not giving up. Next. Uh, so what's going on in Massachusetts? Um, Tom French, the, um, the man from Mass Wildlife, had said that in the past, Massachusetts was doing surveys of their bat populations every 10 years. They now do them annually. Um, they also, um, he said that he doesn't necessarily have hard statistics to back this up, but anecdotally, it seems to him that the po bat population is sort of leveling out, which he hopes means that the bats that are left have some sort of a natural immunity or resistance to the fungus. But as I said earlier before the presentation started, um, because bats have so few pups, it could take 50 to 100 years for the populations to fully recover. So in addition, um, the four most important um, hibernacula sites have been gated to protect the bats from human disturbance. Um, there's also counts and banding of summer maternity colonies that are in two locations, plus whatever information the public um, gives them about those maternity colonies of 10 or more. Um, there is a nanotagging program which tracks the coastal migration routes of bats, so we can try to find out where they're going. And then, though the last point, excuse me, isn't directly related to white nose syndrome, the information can be used there. There is a program um, about putting. Uh, having, let's see, it's um, monitoring bat activity there as part of offshore wind development, um, researchers want to find out what are the coastal migration routes of bats. And so they've got buoys that are owned by the University of Maine that are helping to track bats through coastal areas. So that will be additional information that could be used. Are they tracking them radar or from their I don't know. I, I, only, I, only, I only put like a, I, I only, if you Google bats and buoys, you will, you'll find a whole article on it. 
Um, and I, I can't remember if it was with radar or with tagging. So next, in case you're interested in what's going on in New Hampshire, um, Fish and Game had been, New Hampshire Fish and Game had been monitoring bat populations more frequently than um, Massachusetts had, so they had a pretty good idea of what the habitat, uh, what the populations were, and they were, they were going up for a while, and they sort of steadied off, and then they crashed. Um, so they, um, the population crashed in the, in the winter of 2009 to 2010 when uh, all but one hibernacula population dropped between 50 and 98 percent. And in 2011, um, it, we had lost 98 to 100 percent of some of bats and some hibernacula in New Hampshire. So Fish and Game is participating in national surveys, and they're always looking for help, any information. So if you have a camp up in New Hampshire and you have information you can give New Hampshire Fish and Game, they would really appreciate it. There's also um, ongoing counts of maternity colonies, like in Massachusetts. And finally, there is the Bats in Bunkers project. Um, if you've been along the New Hampshire seacoast, you may have seen some old bunkers from World War II. Some of those are being um, checked out to see if they would be suitable hibernacula for bats. Next. So what can you do to protect hibernating bats? Number one, leave them alone. Stay out of caves in the wintertime. Because even if there isn't white nose syndrome in there, if you're going into a cave in the wintertime, you're going to be bothering them, and you're going to be waking them up, and they're going to be disturbed, and they're going to, again, be using up their fat restores, fat stores that they really need to get them through the winter. Um, it respect gates. This is a gate. Those vertical lines are actually bars keeping people out of a cave in New Hampshire. Um, some caves just have a sign that say, please stay out, hibernating bats. But there are other caves that we don't know that there are bats in there, and so they don't have a sign. But again, it's just you're, it's recommended that everybody just stay out of caves and mines in the wintertime and leave them alone. And if you do enjoy caving, you're asked to please follow the decontamination procedures that U.S. Fish and Wildlife has put together. And I don't know what this means, but it says if you like the new sport of geocaching, I don't know what geocaching is, it says please do not put your cache in a cave or mine and help us spread the word. Can anybody tell me what geocaching is? People chasing around looking for, people leave trinkets or forks, and, and you find them usually with a... Um, GPS? A GPS or our clues. Okay, so it um, says that it's um, y using a GPS or other way of finding small trinkets that someone has left. And it sounds like a lot of fun, but please don't leave them in caves. Um, next. You can um, protect maternity colonies. Um, you want to find solutions whenever you can that will allow bats and people to coexist. For example, if you have bats in your barn and you don't like the bats pooping on your equipment, then maybe, uh, and I've seen this done in New Hampshire, hang tarps up above the height that you need to use so the bat guano is caught in the tarps. They've got their space. You can use the space and you don't have bat poop all over the place. And in the fall, when they go off to hibernate, you can take the tarps down and clean them up. And then everybody gets to win. Um, and again, if there are outbuildings that you have that they're using and it doesn't bother you, you know, let them stay there if you can. Uh, again, with uh, don't exclude, um, don't put up exclusion devices between mid-May to August because you don't want the babies to get left without their mom. Um, build bat houses. Bigger is better. Um, on, on the side of your house, on a pole, um, on a tree, whatever, whatever you feel like you can, you can do at your property. Next. What else can you do? You can report sightings of bats outdoors, either flying or dead, in the winter months. Um, you can report information about maternity colonies and the number up here, and I have a handout with this information as well. Um, you can also make reports to 508-389-6300 or masswildlife at state.ma.us. And if you go to that link, it will send you to a Vermont link because Massachusetts and Vermont share the same uh, information. So don't be surprised if you go to that spot and you end up in Vermont. Next. 
for more information, um, there are constant updates about conservation issues related to bats on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There's also um, the Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife has a fantastic um, document called the Homeowner's Guide to Bats, which there's the link on there, and I, I have handouts with the uh, additional information. US, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has a website about white nose syndrome. U.S. Geological Survey has one. And then there's also a Bat Conservation International. And I put another one on it, it's like whitenose.org or something. There's another one on the handout that I have here. Next. So that's the end of my presentation. And before I take questions, I just want to thank the people that are who sponsored this program. First, Catherine Carney Feldman and the Ipswich Conservation Commission for letting me come and give my presentation. Also, the New Hampshire um, University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, who supports speaking for wildlife volunteers like myself. Um, New Hampshire Fish and Game and Mass Wildlife, who also support volunteers. And this program was actually created with financial support from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and the Davis Conservation Foundation. So thank you for listening, and I can take your questions now. Catherine. question. How do the bats attach themselves safely to hanging um, from the, the ceiling or, or whatever, the walls of a cave? So the question is how do bats... Um, and how do they attach themselves to the, the ceilings of caves? There, they, there has to be something for them to grip onto with their little, with their little, with their little thumbs. So it would be cracks or or stalactites. Stalactites are the top ones. Stalagmites, I think, are the bottom ones. Yeah. So there, there has to be something for them to grab onto with their with their little thumbs. Uh, uh, your, your, oh, sorry. Oh, Anne. The population in, in Europe, I don't know what the population is in Europe, but I do know that it, it's stable. It's, it's not, because it hasn't had the, it, it has that built-in in immunity, apparently, to the white nose syndrome. It, their, it, their only problems with um, bats in Europe would be habitat loss. Um, the, as we, same bats that we have, though, right? I don't believe they're the same bats. There may be some. Um, I, I don't know what the bats are. But I know they have cave bats and migratory bats. And so any any of the cave bats over there just don't have a problem with the white nose syndrome. Yes? Uh, do we share any species between uh, this continent and Europe? Um, do we share any species between this continent and Europe? I don't know. I didn't know whether there's a uh, possibility of uh, introducing some bats that might already have a natural resistance to this into the population here. Mm -hmm. And secondly, looks like maybe some of the existing bats already have had, have immunity to this if the population decline is stabilized. It doesn't look like it's been here long enough for a group of bats to develop that immunity, so it would probably be pre-existing, would it not? If you're looking at a very small population replacement and an introduction or a or, or discovery in 2006 might indicate that pre-existing group of bats already have immunity to um, I think the way that researchers look at immunity is in any given population, you will generally have some individuals, just like back in the time of the bubonic plague and smallpox and Ebola or any, any infectious disease, there's generally a small portion of the population that is, has some sort of natural immunity. Um, as for in this case where the population declined so quickly, the problem is, is there enough of a, a breeding population with enough genetic via, d diversity to have a healthy population to grow back? And as I mentioned, they would grow, they would, because they have so few pups, it would take a very long time. Regarding bringing species from other places here. We've learned over the last hundred years or so, it is never a simple thing when you take a species from some other location and you bring them to where they're not native. The, um, like rabbits in Australia or kudzu in the south. Um, we just, the interaction of species is so complicated that we can't anticipate um, what, what, may or may not occur. Could possibly induce uh, 
introduce animals of the same species, which wouldn't be as if you would, you know, introducing a, a, a foreign species. And, and it may, so like, for example, if there were um, long-eared bats, the same exact genus no. and species in Europe, yes. which there may be, bringing some of those individuals over here yeah, to be a breeding population. Animals, yeah. I have, I have no, I have no idea. I, there, I bet if, if you, if you were really interested, I'm sure that you could find information like that at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, or talk to a researcher who's What's doing like research. Natural immunity, course. I can't see any way of treating this. It's hard to imagine, but you know, scientists are working really hard. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Bats. Can you feed bats? Well, bats are pretty good at feeding themselves. It's a really good question because we have bird feeders and we have butterfly feeders, and we will sometimes people put out feed for um, for squirrels, um, but. We don't need to feed the bats because as long as they're healthy, they can eat all the bugs that they can see. So we just want to keep them happy and leave them alone when they're sleeping, and they'll eat all those mosquitoes that bother us in the summertime. But thank you. They're susceptible to pesticides? Do I think they're susceptible to pesticides? I would imagine that all creatures, to some extent, are susceptible to some to most pesticides, and I haven't heard, unlike um, the, the hive collapse syndrome and honeybees, which I know is, it, it, it's, I think it's a fungus, and um, malnutrition because the plants that they have to get nectar from aren't as nutrition, and, um, and problems with pesticides, and problems with habitat loss, and it's, it's been like this perfect storm of bad things happening for the honeybee. As far as I know with the bats, it is primarily just the fungus, a, a non-native invasive fungus um, that's hurting them. But who knows, they may ultimately find out that they had already been weakened by pesticides or other stressors. So it's a good question. You said that bats are 20 percent of the world. Did you mean species are bats or 20 percent? 20 percent of the species. Okay not the individuals. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, well, thank you all for coming on this really Thanks. bad weather night. Thank you, Alicia. Thanks. And make sure, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to thank Alicia on behalf of the Ipswich Conservation Commission for coming. Um, just want to remind everybody in the audience, this was a live production, so you'll be able to see this program again at your leisure. They will repeat it off and on for the next X amount of weeks, and if you would like to see it on your computer, you should be able to get this as well as all of the other speakers that we've had on the Conservation Commission speaker series on your computer at your convenience at any time by going to icamipswich.com and look up under videos or speakers presentations from the Conservation Commission. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful spring night.